So begin to read, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. And God placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gift, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a, the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection, as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Uh, over the last three weeks, as Mark said, we've been looking at the theme, are you ready? Have we got a bit complacent? Or are we ready? Are we ready for what? Are we ready for Christ's return? Are we ready to rely on God? Are we ready to support in prayer or giving or service our ministry to children and outreach to youth to make sure there's still a generation that will follow ours in faith. Last week we were asked, are we ready to hear from God and do what he says? And next week, Mark will be here to ask us if we're ready to serve. And dropping neatly between those two stools, today I'm going to be asking, are we ready to pay the costs of discipleship? Or as Paul puts it in verse 11 today, are we ready to put the ways of childhood behind us? I like the King James version better it's always better in the original isn't it um, to put away the childish things now we all know how much children cling to a particular toy or blanket and I can remember oh, a long time ago spending a whole afternoon in the rain up and down the king's gardens looking for Barney the blue bear uh, that a godchild had dropped somewhere and was screaming inconsolably for and even mummy had spare Barney uh, which is kept for laundry days in her handbag and this clever toddler could tell the difference and the screaming only stopped when we found the real Barney again. Of course it wasn't in a bush or something, it was at the bottom of the pushchair all along. <laughs> but eventually we put away the childish things. Or do we? You know, I was looking for a picture Matthew, I was looking for a picture, thank you, uh, of a, uh, he's not got a script today, I've told him the cues are sort of automatic, um, he was looking, I was looking for a picture of a man and a toy and I came across this one and on Google you then click on the link to see what article it's come from, it comes from an article, um, it says a quarter of grown men still take a teddy to bed. I, I couldn't believe that. Apparently it's 31% in London, but up here in the north, where we men are more manly, uh, it's only 20%. <laughs> or maybe we're just a bit less honest with ourselves. So what are these childish ways, these childish things that Paul wants us to put behind us? Well, we're going to see. 
Now, today we're looking at Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. It's a very well-known reading, not just today, but to all of us. Always done at weddings, isn't it? This reading, this letter. Yes. <laughs> uh, Paul had planted this church in Corinth. He particularly felt uh, an affection for it five years before. And now hearing about some of the stuff that they were getting up to or not getting up to, he felt they needed a bit of gentle correction in a few areas. And one of the areas he feels the need to explain about at some length is that all the different gifts and ministries in the church don't have a ranking order. They're all from the same Holy Spirit, he says. They serve the same Lord. And they're all for the common good to build up the church and make Jesus known. Like in the human body, all the different parts of the church, all the people in it, in Christ's body, are essential to each other. But he finishes by saying, let's park all that for a moment. Let's put all that to one side. It's not, it's not good. He says, eagerly desire these greater gifts. But yet, I will show you the most excellent way. In some translations, I want to show you the best way of all. And he goes on to explain three things that we've been seeing in today's reading. First, that even if he had all these supernatural gifts, uh, and he did have many of them, he was a great prophet, a great healer, a great teacher, a great apostle. But even if he had all those and didn't have any love in them, he'd just be a waste of space in God's plans for him and in God's purposes. And secondly, he then goes on in this lovely section in the middle to say what love looks like. And finally, he explains why love is best of all. Now, people who live in Arctic regions, I was going to say Eskimos, but Eskimos isn't politically correct anymore. Um, it, we say Inuit, but then if you're not an Inuit and you live in Arctic regions, uh, it, you get very upset as well. So people who live in Arctic regions, since this is probably on tape, are amazed that the English only have two words for snow, or two that I could think of, snow uh, and slush. You're probably going to embarrass me and think of a few more now. Uh, but they have hundreds. They have the sort of crumbly snow that sticks to the bottom of your skis. And they have the, 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 there's actually a word for the sort of hard snow that if you really hate someone, makes a perfect snowball to hit them with. Uh, there's a long article about it on Wikipedia uh, if you're interested. But in the same ways, in English, the word love is an almost incomprehensibly non-specific broad term. Now, John Prue and I... He's not here this morning uh, yet, but uh, John Prue and I sometimes sit in the Hugo Lounge after church and have a little lunch, and we watch a good, a good chunk of this congregation head that way. Now, we know where you're going. We all like Marks and Spencer's food, don't we? We all love Marks and Spencer's food. Um, but the same word, it seems very odd to use the same word to describe the love that a young person feels when they're walking on air because their true love has given them a smile uh, across the classroom or across the bus? Is it the same love as the deep unity of minds in a long marriage? Is it the same love as a mother has for her newborn baby? Is it the same word that we use to describe the overwhelming love of God for us in the sacrifice of Jesus. The most famous pivotal verse in the New Testament, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And first century Greek has different words for all these sorts of love. And the word used throughout this passage, nine times in fact, and the word used mostly throughout the Old Testament is agape. And agape isn't the love of a particular food, isn't the love for Marks and Spencer's lamb rogue and Josh with naan bread, which you can just toast a little lightly. And, sorry, sorry. You all have your own favourites, don't you? <laughs> Agape is not romantic love that we've all known, even if it was a bit unfruitful. You know, um, love is not the deep love that brothers and sisters, uh, agape is not the deep sort of love that brothers and sisters and friends and parents and children have. There are words for all those. It's the love of choice not chance. It's the purest form of love. Uh, it wasn't even a word the ancient Greeks used very much. It's not so much an emotion as an action. It's sacrificial, it's giving, it's uplifting. It's the love that God has for us, giving us his son. It's the love that Jesus says, if we are his disciples, we should then show to others and they will know where it's coming from. Now, Mark Haig has just come in at the back, I see, and when he was younger, you won't believe this, he played in a Christian rock band called 
Unchain the Light. I can remember a great gig at Southport Theatre where Connie Creighton, the late great Connie Creighton, who used to work sooty, came on on stage. Uh, four lovely lads, and they're all from Southport, uh, and they're going to, they call themselves um, Unchain the, the Light. And then she walks off stage, and the sound and the lights and the power of it all comes on heavily. And I think she, she almost fell off the steps as the first blasts of bass hit her. But one of their songs, um, says in it, do you think that love's just a feeling? Do you think you know about love? And then he uses this passage virtually word for word to tell young people this is what real love looks like. This is what God's love looks like. Actually, if we can get the link on YouTube, you, you might be amazed at what late 90s rock music in Southport looked like. But he, Paul is doing what Mark's doing. He's telling us what God's loves look like. God's love looks like, and ours should too. Agape looks like. And in today's reading, 16 descriptions, Paul shows how Christians are to show agape love to each other and to a world that's not based on family bonds or attraction, attractions or a desire to get something back, but it reflects Jesus, a love that always sees the best in each other, that hopes the best for the other person, whoever they are, whatever they've done, including whatever they might have done to you. And never ever, ever gives up. Remember how God demonstrates his love to us. It says in Romans, whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And finally, he finishes by saying, the reason that love is better than all these fancy spiritual gifts, and that's not to mock them, he says, eagerly desire them, they're great gifts. Um, but the reason that love is better is that the other gifts are temporary. When completeness comes, in some versions when perfection comes, i.e. when we see Jesus face to face or when he returns to establish his kingdom, we won't need prophecy, we won't need healing, we won't need teachers or apostles or evangelists or helpers to help build up and serve the church. We will see him face to face and know him fully as we are fully known. Love will abide eternally. So what does this mean for us now? We have to put... Yeah, thank you. What does this mean for us now? Um, we have to put childish ways behind us to put aside childish things, says verse 11. The key verse, I think, in this passage. Well, what does that really mean? Especially when, a few weeks ago, uh, Emily was telling us that Je reminding us that Jesus had told the disciples they had to be like little children. Well, childlike and childish are two very, very different things, aren't they? Childlike means to be reliant on God, as Frank was telling us a few weeks ago. To be reliant on God, to trust in him, to hope in him to stick close to him every day. You know, in my Bible notes last week, Billy Graham tells a story about he's on a long train journey from, say, Chicago to New York. And these days, I suppose the equivalent would be a long, boring flight from London to Singapore. It takes about 14 hours, doesn't it? And there's turbulence on this flight. And the electronic screens have gone down, so there's no movies on this flight. And in the middle of the flight, Billy Graham looks over at the little boy on the other side of the aisle um, who is sat on the other side of the aisle from him and this little boy is looking very, very happy and eventually says, son, son, why are you looking so happy? And he goes, you know what, um, my father, when we get to where we're going, my father is waiting for me. I'm going to be meeting my father. And that's childlike trust in life. Whatever happens, we know we will one day be meeting our Father in heaven. And uh, in fact, um, I'll go further. We'll never be able to put the childish ways behind us unless we can develop the childlike trust that Paul is talking about here. Now, childishness is different. We can all be childish. I, I recognize it in myself. Paul says he spoke like a child, he thought like a child, he reasoned like a child. How do children speak without thinking, impulsively, without considering the effect of their words? How do children think, often selfishly, with self-pity, with a deep sense of having been unfairly treated or not having what others have had? 
with envy, with self-doubt. Yes, with self-doubt, not believing they can do something like ride a bike without stabilizers or act like a shepherd in the nativity play. And how do they reason immaturely without taking responsibility? It was him, it was her, it was them. And we see it in ourselves. It was Eve. Eve made me do it. You know, we don't take responsibility. These are the childish ways that Paul sees, not just in others, but indeed he admits elsewhere that he sees in himself that he is still far from perfection. But thinking like a man or woman of God, a grown-up Christian, is what he aspires to for himself and for the others who follow Jesus. It's what he knows he will reach when perfection, when completeness comes. You know, parents, those of you who've been parents know, you can't just scream at kids to grow up, grow up. You know, you have to constantly encourage them if you want them to change, to think of others and not just about themselves, and to take responsibility for their own decisions and actions. That's what psychologists call maturity, and spiritual maturity is what Paul's aiming for. Christians who take responsibility, who make decisions and stick to them, and love others in a way that their heart would not naturally find easy. The cost of growing up in Christ, the cost of discipleship, is the effort it takes on a daily basis to put childish ways of thinking behind us and love as we have indeed been loved ourselves. And Jesus tells a story of a father who had two sons, not the father of the prodigal sons. There's another father who had two sons. Yes. And uh, he says, lads, lads, it's a lovely day down there. It's a sort of North London vineyard. It's a lovely day down there. And those vines aren't exactly going to weed themselves. How's about a nice day digging in the sand? And one said, sir, sir, it says, master in the Greek, I will not. But later in the day, it says he went and got digging. And the other said, yes, sir, I need the exercise. I like digging. I want to please you. But he didn't actually get round to going. So on the left there is the one who said, I, I'm not going, but did. And on the right is the one who uh, talks the talk, but didn't actually go. And Jesus asks in Matthew 21, which son ended up doing the will of the Father. There's a cost to discipleship, and that cost is intentional love for others. And if we can't manage that, we will just be indeed a waste of space, as Paul says, a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. There was a cost to the Corinthian Christians, as there's been a cost to every Christian in the 2,000 years since. And there's a cost, especially in our own generation. We've heard from tabs how 95% of children have never been near a church. If you go into the schools these days, we, we know about declining congregations, an age profile that bodes ill for 20 years from now. Does that depress us? It should not depress us if we put the ways of childhood behind us, if we put behind us self-doubt, self-pity, being passive, being fearful, it should challenge us to love this world like Jesus did. The church in 20 years will not look like it looks now, but people will still need to hear about God's love as much as they, um, uh, as they did in 1821, 200 years ago when we were planted, and as much as they did in Corinth, this vast city in which there are only a handful of Christians. You know, I want to encourage you, just as I finish uh, today, not by having a go at anyone, but by sharing what I see as I look around this church. I look around it more since I've retired, I have a bit more time. I see people forgiving and bearing with one another. I see service. I see amazing acts of generosity in the church, not just of money, but of spirit, of, of forgiveness, of kindness, of encouragement, of time. Many reach out to the frail and elderly to sustain them in the difficult part of their journey. Cafe Church and our Warm Friday are really going well and reaching new people, and we can share Jesus' love through those. Jan was telling me, yesterday that on our free day we're free on a Friday what sort of cafe is free on a Friday but people won't 
they, they won't take no for an answer. Some people who can want to put money in to subsidise those who can't. And some days we're making more than if we'd had the cafe open and charged. Margaret was telling... <laughs> Margaret was telling me about a cafe, that's not the point of course, uh, Margaret was telling me about a cafe owner, uh, she was chatting to about the cafe um, uh, at the free day, and the cafe owner said, look, I want to make you some soup. Others are bringing friends and neighbours down. Uh, and I'm amazed how many people have come to this church through things like Midweek Music or Tuesday at Two, which are great fellowships for bringing people in. Tabs, the one who has to face a world in which no one has ever heard about Jesus, except as a swear word. And we used to say that 20 years ago, but it wasn't true. People had some experience of church. Now the kids don't. But he says, you know what? The conversations he has are much, much more honest, much better than conversations he had 10 years ago because there's no baggage coming with them people i taught at kids club years ago are growing up jack and megan uh, love grove are the backbone uh, of, of our youth helpers bethany is at university um, if you want to go on lancaster university christian union's website she's leading an outreach to students now this is the cunning bit they hire a venue they make lots of pizza they invite the students in, they serve them the pizza of their choice, and you know what students like, some will be vegan, some will be, you know, whatever, and then, and they, they love them, they show agape to them, and then they tell them, you know this love? It's because Jesus loves us, and they tell them about a father who loves them, and a saviour who died for them. Cunning, but it's not meant to be cunning, it's meant to be loving. This is agape in action. Other people here are praying passionately that soon, rather than later, we will get permission from our deanery and our diocese to advertise for a new leader and then that when we advertise we'll get the right person this is not going to be easy as i have uh, been to a few other churches over christmas you realize that we are a very special church in a very special place at a very special time but we should all be praying that somewhere out there god's spirit is already stirring the heart of the man or the woman who will take this church forward over the next decade or longer, a decade in which this church in this country and in our town will change more than in the 202 years since some people say, hey, why don't we build a church up there in the dunes? You know, there must be some people who want to go there. So Paul says we all need to put these childish ways behind us. Um, we have to, as the Americans might say, put on our big boy pants and our big girl pants and be mighty men and women of God. We don't, Paul says, have to flog ourselves to death on a daily basis. We don't have to give away all we possess. We just have to aspire each day as we start the day in our prayer life, as we walk with God, to love others in the same way that we have known the love of God. Yes, we'll get it wrong constantly. Paul got it wrong. I get it wrong constantly. But we have to pick ourselves up again because we are not children. We are mighty men and women of God called to walk with him. We have 16 ways in today's reading to emulate what love looks like. And I'm just going to read them again. I don't think I'll do it as well as David did. This is what love looks like. This is what God's love to us looks like. This is what our love to others should look like. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It isn't proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It doesn't self-seek, it's not easily angered, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs, it doesn't delight in evil, it rejoices in truth, it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres, it never fails. Whatever the person you meet in church, out of church, has said, has done, are they who they are, whatever they are, you want the very best for them in their lives and their knowledge of God. We can't do it by ourselves, but if we wait on him, trust in him, and hope in him, as our memory verse of the year says, he will renew our strength. I just want to, sh Gene, Gene, where's Gene gone? Gene, would you come and share what was in your notes? <laughs> because you thought it was relevant, I thought it was relevant. Maybe some people here will be uplifted by it. I don't know if other people are 
know Irene reads the uh, same notes as I do. It was just a comment, um, uh, somebody speaking with Gandhi, and it was a missionary, I think it was Stanley Jones, and he said to him, it's not that I reject your Christ, I don't reject your Christ, he's wonderful. It's just that so few Christians are like him. Thank you, Jean. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the bountiful and endless and patient love that you have shown us and you continue to show us every day. We thank you for your presence and purposes in our lives. Lord, help us put away childish thoughts of insecurity and selfishness and doubt and fear and confusion. Lord, help us put those behind us as a child's toys are put away. Help us be childlike in our dependence on you. And Lord, we pray that in all the people we meet, in all the interactions that we have, people will see something of your love for us in the way that we love others. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.